We're back with Nanakwame, and this time you have me at a disadvantage where you've loved a lot of the Nanakwame Ajay Brenya stories that we've done from Friday Black. So you went out and read the whole book, is my understanding. I listened to the whole book. It's amazing. It, I just, I can't get enough of it. Uh, one day we have to beg him to come on to the, the, the show with us, the podcast, the YouTubes, and uh, talk with us about this book because it's so good. It just, every story mm-hmm. is a home run and every story is relevant. And I feel like every story is a teachable moment and a learning lesson to society today. It, it's just, it's that social contract in, in a nutshell. And I love it. This story we're, we're a young boy, Isaiah Zay, who works at a place called Injustice Park, which I bet you if this were made to a movie, they'd change the name to Justice Park to kind of give it that tongue in cheek thing. Cause would you really call it Injustice Park? I don't know, but <laughs> he works in, they have these different modules, like almost kind of like, they're not AR, but like, it's kind of like Westworld. You're entering into yep. the experience, you know what I mean? And, and he exactly. works in what, like they've got the the terrorist train one and it, it doesn't matter, but there's one called Cassidy Lane where basically you're, you're in a suburb and he's basically the African-American black kid that's walking through minding his own business and you get to basically challenge it, question why he's there. And ultimately, it said eight out of ten, ten people choose to murder you, the, the Isaiah, in this story. It's it's a very interesting thought experiment. I would almost argue with you and say it's not a thought experiment. It is a obvious, I think, story related to what has actually happened in the United States many times. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, OK, even looking at the title. But but. Yes. Well, when we look at this, I don't view it as straight allegory in the sense okay. of I'm referencing this specific event. And maybe there's a lot of things like, I mean, obviously Zimmerland, we're, we're, we're talking, I mean, Zimmer, right? Like we're talking about George Zimmer, right? Yeah. What's yeah, George name? Zimmerman. Zimmerman. Zimmerman, sorry. Yeah, I couldn't remember the name. Um, Tr- Tr- Trayvon Martin, right? Like like yep. ba- basically someone who had, so when the story first starts, it's, it's, the, it's the same narrative, right? Like, like exactly. I, I, w- I was defending my home. If you go back to his, uh, remember the, the what was it? The five story? Uh, yes, uh, Finkelstein five. Yes, yes. So I'm defending my territory, right? Uh, and then the, and then you do you dig more into it, and you find out Zimmerman had called the police constantly, and it was almost always about black males showing some some prejudice slash expectations, and that's the problem is is the court of battle problem is that a lot of times the black person becomes the, the person that's wrong and what what could Trayvon martin have been doing wrong other than just walking around existing like do, doing nothing but minding my own business right and then basically not complying to someone and then the ending up in the taking of a life right like while that's the story of like the specific case and obviously the story is kind of named after that uh it's it's like you said it's events that happen it's like and we need to talk about that because because why does that happen racism <laughs> yeah I, I think that that I mean, that's a simple answer right um but that but it's not a simple it, there's really not a simple answer I think there's a lot more to it than um just that but i I think the story goes into why is this happening why is it happening over and over again in our country and then I think for me, the hope is what can this story teach us so that we don't have to learn through violence anymore? Mm -hmm. (sighs) Teaching is a difficult thing because I'm kind of just reacting. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm still, I'm still feeling the story with the way that when we look at Isaiah, why does he do this job? Right. Like this is a day to day occurrence for him where he's like, okay, I'm going to go in and I'm probably going to get murdered for, for sold doing his soul. Nothing. Right. <laughs> well, well, there is that quote. I, I actually wrote yeah. that one down. It said, people say, sell your soul like it's easy, but your soul is yours and it's not for sale. Even if you try, it'll still be there waiting for you to remember it. Now, what's funny is, is, is your usage of it just now was, was almost him. I think you were implying him. I took that quote to be almost referring to the people that are choosing to do the shooting, right? Like you have to live with that. You have oh. to you have to live with your decision. So that's an interesting way, like, and, and maybe I misread it. It doesn't matter. I'm reacting. 
right? And to be, to be, cause, cause to me, I don't know. Did you take a big part of the story being choice because you have that pedestals with like the, the gun, the do nothing or the call the cops, call right? the cops. And, and most people choose the weapon. They choose violence, right? Is, is one way to look at it. Yeah. The whole story is about choice. Isaiah is choosing to work this job. Uh, he's, you know, chosen to quote, sell his soul uh, for for money because he sees it as a teachable moment and i i feel like isaiah is kind of an idealist he he thinks that maybe he can change things from the inside and i don't think that's a bad thing i think that it's a tough conversation we need to have and that he knows that if he does nothing then nothing changes if he does something then maybe something can change he just is um maybe a little bit naive of how business works. And that's kind of one aspect of well as well. I think there's a little bit of capitalism in here. Um, so as Isaiah, uh, as we, as you go through the story, you realize that he um, is like one of their number one stars. He's very, very popular as you know, the, the kid that gets shot and he's promoted to be part of um, a committee that is going to be making decisions for this, you know, theme park and there's somebody on there that doesn't like him. And then you see inside of the meeting, the one person that doesn't like him is, an, is another black person. And it's like, ah. Uh, and so, like, there's very there's a lot of layers to this story. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, there, there's the pushing pushing others down to get yourself up. Uh, they, they are pulling other people down, too. They call that crab mentality. Like, if one crab wanted to get out of a bucket by himself, he could. But when there's a bunch of crabs in the bucket, as soon as you see one person starting to succeed, you pull that person down. The crabs pull the crab down that's getting out of line, right? And it, it's interesting because if we even just look at this place where he works, right, he has to enter from behind Lady Justice, right? And there's a lot of symbolism there of the way that she's pointing the sword directly at the people in line saying that I'm going to deliver swift justice, and that's what these people get to do, right? And you're and you're kind of right, I think, because Isaiah is an idealist. I think I think I would agree with that statement on some level, because he, he he's like, hey guys, uh, maybe what we should do is have them go through the trial, right? Make yeah. them see the ramifications of their choices. Make them see that that the morality and justice system sit here behind our choices, right? And they're like. Uh, uh, no, we just want them to viscerally, viscer, viscerally feel the murder, and and the police do like almost like a cursory, okay, you know, move along, it's fine type of thing, almost like reinforcing that they can get away with it. On one yeah, there, there's no consequences, right? So, mm -hmm. at time and time again, Isaiah is out there, and you know, the person comes out of the house, and there's this reenactment, and he he doesn't necessarily always try to entice violence, but he's supposed to as part of his job. And then they get to kill him and then it's done and they get he says they get like an email or something and then it's over like they there's no consequences to your actions. And I think that that's something that for me that I pulled out of, you know, what Nana Kwame is saying is that in this country, certain people can do things and there are no consequences. Why is it? race is it money is it power is it religion w what is it that allows some people in this country to get away with literal murder and other people can't walk down the street safely what do you think the point of the mecca suit was on isaiah right he gets threatened with an extremely stereotypical conversation and i say stereotypical if you go online and look up First Amendment audits. Like, and if you know what the First Amendment is in terms of the Constitution, right? Like, you have freedom of press, freedom of, of movement, et cetera, et cetera. But the idea is that you could take video and make stories, generate content off anything in public, right? And, and what people do is they go to like post offices, uh, places where you wouldn't normally want to take a video, or, or even like a federal prison. Like, you can film it from the street. And people, it, it, it's like the same conversation, which is why I say stereotypical. What are you doing? seems suspicious, right? It's that intersection between this is legal and lawful, but different, right? So in, in these stories, uh, uh, simulations, I guess I should say, he's just walking down the street, minding his own business, I believe the narrative says. And someone says, hey, what are you doing here? 
right? And it's that conversation of I own this territory and I'm in I'm in control, so you better conform, right? So where does conformity and and lawfulness intersect is an extremely difficult conversation because some people, I mean, they think, oh, it's so simple. Just comply and answer what the guy says and you won't get in trouble. But when you comply constantly and you lose power and control, all of a sudden mm. you find that you might be in a much worse situation, right? So, so there is absolutely a battle between want and desires and legal and lawful. And, and this story perfectly elicits that. So why bring the mecha suit into the picture that when things start to get violent, when he wants to, and he can hit that button and puff up and take power when he wants, what's the point of that? I don't know if so much. If I saw a, a symbolism in the suit beyond protection, um, I thought it was just kind of a cool idea that the suit allowed him some semblance of protection. I feel like the whole thing is created on hypervigilance that this scenario plays out and the suit, it may be for protection. Um, the suit may be uh, taking it to a hyper violence uh, arena so that, you know, the person that's doing the killing can feel justified in what they're doing. I don't know if it's so mm -hmm, much for Isaiah. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like it's for the the guest, you know, or the the the, per, the park goer than anybody that they feel like they were justified in what they were doing. No, 100%. That, that's exactly how I took it, too, because it reminds me of the Finkelstein 5 story. Thank you for reminding me of that, where the guy's like, I was defending, I was defending my children. I was defending my land, right? And even that guy at the end brings his 11-year-old son to watch. Watch what? Watch him defend his land from a guy that's doing nothing but walk around and you feel like he shouldn't but then you cross the ultimate barrier and line of murder to do it. Well, when you feel threatened, what better way to make yourself feel more threatened than have the other person puff up and, and, and exaggerate them than, than bigger than they actually were, right? So that, that brings me to two questions then. Why do some people feel like that person, quote, shouldn't be there? And then what gives an individual the right to feel like they can exercise violence on another human being. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> if I knew the answer to that question, my friend, I would be a millionaire. Because when, when you You'd look be president. At, yeah. Well, okay, I'll take that. But when, when you look at these First Amendment audits, you have people that get absolutely irate. Like, you can't video of me. I said, stop videoing me. I'm going to call the cops. And the cops come and they're like, I, I can't do anything. Like, what he's doing is legal and lawful, right? And same thing's true with, with, with what basically Isaiah is doing here. He's just walking around. He might be suspicious. You might call the cops on him. But there's nothing that justifies any form of violence against him other than you feel like he's a threat. Like, when that, that mecha suit expands and you feel threatened, right? There's some type of psychological fear that you have from the unknown or the different, right? And you see that with the stories as people research into some of these things about how many of the calls Zimmerman made that were on black males and how on the calls, he says, they always get away with it, right? There are certain triggers in his mind that make him more fearful and they there's nothing you can do to justify that. That's something that, that needs to get worked on. Is, is to stop having the fear of basically something different, someone who's different than you. It, it just, you can't logically explain it per se other than fear. But what is it that in our society has been perpetuated throughout history that young black males are something to fear? I don't understand it. I, I, and, and maybe it's me I, I know historically racism and things like that, but I just, I don't understand where it's been perpetuated time and time again that young black men are something to fear. Um, it's just, it, it, it boggles my mind. I don't get it. I just, I guess I, I, I've learned from my wife so much to look for the good in people that whoever they are, they're just trying to live their best life. They're just trying to get by. They're just trying to take care of their family. They're trying to eat. They're trying to live. They're trying to survive. And it doesn't matter if they're, you know, LGBTQ, white, black, purple, you know, whatever they are, whatever they believe in, it's just they're trying to do their thing in life. And I just, 
it's it, it it breaks my heart that there are people out there um that that think that way that i i have something to be fearful of because of x y and z because you know you look at who are the most you know uh prolific serial killers you know they're 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 you and me, <laughs> right? I mean, they're they're middle aged white dudes, so it just I don't know. It's it's very strange to me. I wish I knew the answer. I wish we had the answer. Well, me, me I I don't know the answer, but I'll I'll say this. I have talks with my son about what I think is right and wrong. Right? Do I think it's right to be mean to someone to steal from them. I'm trying to, I'm boiling this down. If you, for those watching out there that don't know what my son's eight. Okay. So we're talking real simple questions here and his friends will do something that's, that's mean where they say something that's hurtful or they won't, they won't participate with him in something cause they're mad at him or I don't know, just stupid, you know, eight year old kid stuff. Right. <laughs> and Mason will be like, well, I told the teacher or I wanted them to do this and I say, you know, we got to have one of those difficult conversations of people aren't always going to do what you want. People have different things that make them happy, different things to pursue. And just because someone has a difference doesn't give you the right to come over and override that, to, to come over and make them do something that is just they have a different view on things. Right. And I think that's sometimes what we see is where someone's afraid or or thinks they have a right to something that may not be legal, may not be lawful, and they try to override others on that. And, and that, that makes it sound a lot simpler than it actually is. But when you look at these these conversations, what gives someone a right to come in and, and do something that's just, just cause harm to another human being? And the answer is always nothing. Right? Like you, uh, that's just, there's just no excuse for it, right? And in this story, you see how there's that guy that says like, oh, it's a repeat patron. Right. And if we look at the goals of, of, of Zimmerland or Z uh, sorry, Z Zimmerland, it's Zimmerland, right? Yeah. Um, no, in Justice Park. Sorry. It's a safe space for adults to explore problem solving, justice and judgment. Mm. Mm. I, well, one, I don't believe it because they don't do <laughs> they don't do the judgment. They don't do the justice. Right. Yeah, they don't finish the story. No. And even with problem solving, they're like, well, what if we offered something else besides just a gun? Like people are always just drawn towards the violence. What if there are other options? I, I don't believe it actually does those things. It's kind of like that facade people put on. Number two, to provide the tools for patrons to learn about themselves in curated heightened situations. I can buy this, right? What is it you're learning? And for that one patron to keep coming back, well, he got bloodlust. Right. He's got anger and fear that he is taking out in an AR experience that at some point might go beyond that. And that's extremely unhealthy, potentially, I think. Uh, again, you could have a little bit of the, again, super controversial, the, the, the video game argument of like, oh, video games that are violent make your kids more violent. It's like, okay, well, what's the research on that? I realize I'm going down that hole too far there, but allow me to circle back. And number three was to entertain for them to viscerally feel it, which ultimately gets changed to entertain for children of all ages. And again, I, I have a lot of problems with that too, because we segregate movies, music with parental discussion. Why would a visceral experience of murder be any different? And that's what I think is, is what really is horrifying about not a Kwame story is the way that that pulls on those strings there where you're just like, you could just see the disaster on the wall. Yeah, that's what the last thing I was going to kind of bring up. As we get to the end of the story, we realize that they're they're expanding their park to have a um, new simulation, which was really heartbreaking to me. Um, the one where you try to find a bomb in a school or something. Uh, I, I can't go there, being a former school teacher. Uh, but the other thing is, is that there's no longer an age restriction to the park that will be open to all ages. And I, I feel like that's just nurturing, you know, violence. And you have one of his regular patrons, uh, Isaiah, says, oh, th th this, you know, is Bob or whatever. You know, he doesn't know the guy's name, but he recognizes that his shirt, that he's coming so often that his shirt is stained with the fake blood. And he's brought his 11-year-old son and that, you know, he's exposing him to this. And there, I mean, th that's what's kind of crazy is that, there are rules and laws in our country that forbid minors, no matter what parents say, 
you know, as a minor, you are forbidden from doing this because the government says whether your parents want to allow it or not, as a society, as a whole, we say this is bad for you. Smoking, gambling, alcohol, pornography, all those things are outlawed to you. Even if your parents want to give them to you, technically they're outlawed until your specific ages. But something like this, you're just allowed to go do? And just like, that's kind of true. And that's something that I think as a society we need to look at as a whole. Yeah. And there's a lot to be said about choice there. When, when do you have a choice? When do you not have a choice? When you do have a choice, when is it a sketchy choice? When is it a good choice? When is there universal expectations? When should those expectations be challenged, right? He, he every time would respond in an agitated but lawful way. I'm just, I'm just being me. I'm just trying to exist, man. If you could just leave me alone, I would, I would appreciate that. Right. And, and as soon as it's, it's almost like you, we mentioned earlier, like he had expectations to be agitating. I don't even know if that's true. Like I, I, engaging a, maybe it's hard because the, the guy probing has expectations of you will behave this way and answer my questions. He doesn't have, a, he doesn't have to. Right? Yeah, where's that be, obligation come from, right? Yeah, like it's extremely complex. Like so, so if we go back to the puffed up suit question, he doesn't necessarily puff up his suit here. What does that mean? Right? Does that mean that yeah. this man's choice to choose violence is no longer justified by threat, and that it really is just a choice? Does it go back to that pedestal? So if he chose that gun, there, there's a lot to be said about a man's choice to choose violence and almost like try to push out anything that's different. Yeah, I, as I, I was reading the end of the story uh, or listening to it for the second time, I kept coming back to the idea of what does this say about the father? What does it say about Isaiah? What does it say about society and us as a whole? If he turns on the suit, does that justify the violence? If he doesn't, does that not justify the violence? And I don't know. But for me, I, I never think that I can justify violence. I just, I, I'm, I'm a talker, you know, that, that's I mean, literally part of my job. We're, we have conversations. Our goal is to have people talk about books, to have conversations. I just feel like... There, there's, there's, and I've said this so many times in so many videos, there's, there's two ways out of everything. There's violence and talking. And I just feel like talking is always the right solution. Mm -hmm. Well, in, we talk about so much choice from the, from the man's perspective and from Isaiah's perspective. What about the child? The, the way that he says, daddy, stop. And he tries to intervene. We, we, we've talked about influence, about trauma is this something that the child's ability to choose is taken away when he's traumatized by this, right? Is he going to be someone who begets more violence as a result of seeing this violence? And as a self-defense mechanism, he's going to think he's at, at, at a threat, at danger when there is none, right? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, Isaiah doesn't have a gun, does he? He doesn't have a weapon nope. besides, besides the has, suit, the quote He has unquote? the suit and the cigarette. That's it. Okay, so, Oh, that's right. And he even fumbles with a cigarette, right? So, so, so where's this coming from? Like, where, where is this threat coming from to feel like your safety has gone when the other person doesn't even have a weapon? And that's terrifying to think that you could pass that down. I'd like to think that the child's choice matters here. He says, get yeah. behind me. And I'd like to think that the child can stop him, but, but the narrative cuts short. Right. And that's me projecting. That's me projecting being optimistic. If I were more pessimistic, <laughs> I'm like, like oh my, I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, this child's going to be the next patron yep. in another 10 years. And, yep. and that's, that's what's kind of absolutely terrifying to me. But that's what's happened in real life, right? I mean, you've seen violence in our country from the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1970s, race riots in the 80s. Come on. I mean, LA, I mean, <laughs> Chicago. Uh, and then nowadays with, you know, people getting shot in their homes, shot on the street, uh, it just, it, it, it perpetuates itself. And I think that for me, the story is saying, why can't it change? And then how can it change? And as you pointed out, it's the next generation that has to finally be done with violence. 
And I think that we're seeing a lot of that today. I think that uh, Nanane Kwame would be proud of, of the younger generation uh, moving towards a more nonviolent uh choice in life which is you know great hopefully eventually right right like i would agree with you there that there's we're not at the finish line right if, you, no. if you're at the if you're like hey we're at the finish line like we're we're not even in the same realm of, of what no. we read and think what we think is is right uh are, are we better off than we were 50 years ago i i think universally yes right and i think a lot of that comes down to like you said the choice while we might traumatize, and honestly, I do my best with my child. I really do. It's hard. It's hard to be on 100% of the time as a human being when you get mad, right? You you, you hear about P, uh, I forget the term, like PSA, whatever the term is for parents, like that go nuts when their child doesn't get as much playing time as other kids in a sport and stuff like that. Like it's easy to just lose yourself to the point of this park in those visceral moments and react. And, and I think you do discover parts of yourself. And I think that's what hopefully we're passing down is, is continuing to push to be better. I don't want to get more preachy, but, but I do think we are getting better. And I agree with your point that we, we assessing that I think we're better than where we were, but I don't think we're at the finish line yet. No, we're not even close to the finish line. I think that the stories like these are inspiring and these conversations are things that we need to have so that people make better choices and have those conversations to where when you don't know somebody, get to know them, ask them. I mean, it, mm, it's mm. it's a lot harder, I think, to be uh, violent towards a friend Um I mean, it's easier to be mad at somebody you love, for sure, right? <laughs> Get mad at my wife all the time. <laughs> but, you know, um, when you have those conversations, no matter how small or big they are, I, I think that it creates that bond. And it then then violence isn't even a thought, um, you know, because you, you wouldn't treat your brother that way. And if you have a conversation like everybody's your brother, then you'll make those, you know, more peaceful choices. At least, you know, I hope that these stories can do that one day in the future. So, well, I wonder the eight of the 10 are that, that guy, right. That chose violence, that chose to murder basically Isaiah. What are those other two? Like the two out of the 10 that didn't murder him was violence still the option was a verbal altercation all it was or did they just total choose total peace like like who were those two out of ten that didn't murder and and what were those were they peaceful were they violent but got resolved in other ways like it's interesting to see the story depicts an ultimately pessimistic story of of america but at the same time that doesn't mean it's not without hope right the options are slim but it's never never <laughs> Yeah, I wonder like those those two, right, are what what is that scenario? Uh, you know, what what are their ages? Are they younger? Are they older? Um, you know, what are their ethnicities? Was it a man or a woman? Like, do those things matter? Should they matter? Probably not, but it'd be interesting to have that information. Uh, I mean, it'd be a good uh a thought experiment. Yeah. Yeah, no, there's a lot to the story. We we didn't even really discuss the, the girlfriend discussions, right? We didn't discuss, oh, yeah. <laughs> we didn't discuss how like at work, his ideas were just passed over, right? Like, yeah, 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 yep. yeah. And like he got, he got swept under the rug and, and the girlfriend that left him, left him for uh, the guy that was in power, like the, the, the talking head. The owner of will. the company. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, there, there's a yeah. lot to describe with any Nana Kwame story. And, and so one, there, there's parts that we don't explore, but there's also probably viewpoints that you might have that are different than ours. I, I'd love for you to share with them, exp express with us like what's your view uh, you could totally disagree on some things and that's okay it's not a matter of being right or wrong it's a matter of what do our experiences say how do we see things differently because only through talking about those talking about those experiences i think do we really open up and possibly make different choices that might be wrong today so so if you had a totally different reaction or or thoughts on some of those things that we didn't explore let us know in the comments down below. It really would mean a lot to me. And it would also mean that, you know, you're paying attention, engaging with us in the conversation, which is ultimately the goal. We're not here to teach someone about a story. We're here to explore. And I hope you had a good time enjoying and exploring the story with us. I look forward to hearing from you in the comments. And again, Nana Kwame playlist down below. Guy does not write a bad story. My name is Benuna. Peace. 
Peace.